So th thank you very much for the uh, the great introduction, the very nice introduction, and thanks for the uh, the invitation for organizing this. I hope you all had coffee because with no light you're gonna you're gonna sleep. So. I mean, you came to hear a deep mind, and here I am. I'm just a, a bloke who does, who does software, so I'll, I'll talk about software. As a disclaimer, I was, yeah, one of the person who got scikit-learn going, maybe the initiator, even though it's a complex story, but, I mean, it's a pretty massive team. We're an army. Uh, you got to realize this is not, I, not me, right? This is an army. Uh, so, what I'd like to talk about today is, I'd like to talk about software because, because it's important, because it has a pretty huge impact on the world. And so, I'd like to walk you through how we're trying to make it easier for people to use machine learning for brain imaging. So, with scikit-learn and learn. And and so I'll start with maybe talking about my research, so what I'm paid for, which is thinking about how to do machine learning for brain imaging. Then I'll talk about scikit-learn and learn. Uh, so as a disclaimer, I have a focus, a bias on brain mapping. Uh, not every machine learning for brain imaging falls in this description. Uh, so it's, it's important to think about our applications. And so in medical applications, I mean, we think we're looking at brains and some might have, you know, some disease, some, some problem, something we want to look at. And it seems like it's a very well-posed problem for uh, predictive models, right? Uh, so there are different problems we can solve, and it's useful to understand the different problems we can solve. The first one is diagnosis, so can we you know, find, can we predict the nature of a disease condition? Another very important one is prognosis. Can we predict the evolution? And this might be useful because it will enable the doctor to uh, choose different uh, uh, therapies. Uh, another important one is early biomarkers. So the idea here is that we will uh, detect before uh, standard sim symptoms. And so this could be useful for population screening, and maybe the best example is breast cancer. Uh, so cancer in general, in, in particular breast cancer, if it's detected early, is good chances of a good outcome. If it's detected too late, well, not a good thing. Uh, and another thing that we might address is uh, to develop quantitative biomarkers. So the idea is that this is typically the case in, in a disease that are ill-defined, like uh, neuropsychiatric diseases, like autism, or, or even Al Alzheimer, a, neurologi a neurological disease. Uh, so the, the good thing about a quantitative biomarker is that it's based on the biology and not on the intuition of the, uh, um, of the physician. And this can be useful for, for drug development. You're trying to uh, develop a drug for Alzheimer's, uh, is the drug working or not? Should you wait uh, 10 years for people to die or survive to know whether your drug is, is working or not? I'm stressing these because it's really important when you do machine learning to think about how it's going to be applied because it means that the kind of errors and the kind of data you need to work uh, with are going to be different. So it's also really important to, to realize that uh, we're not in the short term going to fully replace the physician. Uh, the physician has access to the patient history, so okay, we can try to include the patient health record, but that's uh, an endeavor that goes beyond medical imaging. Uh, the physician will decide what therapeutic strategy uh, he will uh, use because there are logistical con constraints, because maybe the, the patient or the uh, family has uh, a different point of view on this. So this, the reason I'm stressing this is that Apart for very like, specific problems such as detection of a lesion, detection of a specific aspect in an image, we do not want black box models. We want to be able to explain them, we want to be able to interpret them because they're going to be used as a tool by the physician to support his decision and they won't replace the physician. So the problem is the underlying problems are, are things like segmentation, denoising as much as, as prediction. This is what I call the why question. So, 
One thing I'm also interested in is uh, can we uh, use machine learning on brain imaging to understand better brain function? And it's the whole realm of uh, cognitive uh, neuroimaging. So the idea being that you want to link uh, neural activity to thoughts. Uh, this is somewhat outside medical applications, even though if we understood this link, we would probably understand better uh, neuropsychiatric disorders. But right now, the realm of, uh, of the study is mostly on, on healthy patients. And so the way you can pitch this as a machine learning problem is to say, on the one hand, I have descriptions of measurements of brain activity, and the, on the other hand, well, no, on the one hand, I have measurements of brain activity, and on the other hand, I have descriptions of behavior. And then you can uh, try to uh, predict one way, so go from descriptions of behavior to predicting brain activity, or predict the other way, which is to go from uh, activity to descriptions of behavior. Now, if you want to stay in the realm of, uh, of medical imaging, uh, you just replace descriptions of behavior by descriptions of pathology or clinical uh, situation, and you're, this is the same formal problem, right? And it's important to, to realize that there are two different questions, and both are interesting. Okay? And by the way, uh, this, this first question is the typical way of doing brain mapping. So mass univariate standard analysis is really a statistical model that tries to explain uh, brain activity, well, brain measurements from descriptions of behavior. And an additional thing that we could do is that we could run unsupervised learning on massive amount of uh, brain imaging data, and this might be useful to find some form of informed uh, data reduction, such as brain parcellations. So in fMRI, this is typically done in, in resting state. Okay. So the, re the reason I'm, I'm explaining this is because Nylearn sits in all those different use cases and tries to make them easy. So typically, the, the most common problem is that, at least the problem that people often want to work on, is decoding. The idea being that you're going to try to predict from brain data some stimuli or some pathology. The nice thing in this, if you use a linear model, is that the coefficients of the linear model are brain maps. So they're highly interpretable for a good reason. Now, an, another uh, setting in unsupervised uh, learning is resting state fMRI. And the, the core intuition of why this is important is simply because data without labels is cheaper and universal. You can accumulate data without uh, labels. The problem is it often comes without salient features. This is an image of resting state uh, um, uh, brain activity, so nothing really sticks out. And if I played a movie, it would just go flash, 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 and you wouldn't be able to see anything. So the way we, we tackle this is we decompose this, this um, uh, brain activity in different functional regions, and then we learn uh, interactions. Uh, and then based on these interaction, this interaction graph, which we call a a functional connectome, so connectivity, brain connectivity, then we can uh, look across subjects, across uh, conditions, and detect differences or do a supervised learning task. So this is um, a pipeline that we've been working a lot on, which is to go from rest fMRI to biomarkers. And the idea is that for neuropsychiatric diseases, this is probably important because it's a way of capturing, uh, it's a way of capturing brain activity. So function, brain function, and neuropsychiatric disorders, uh, we believe that function is probably the right way to look at them. OK, so because of all these questions, we started years ago a toolkit for machine learning in Python. And our motivation was really we need standard algorithms to do this. And as, as I came from a different field, as I came from physics, I I, I knew that I didn't want to solve the problem only from one field because I knew that the core problems were universal. An SVM is useful for medical imaging, but it's also useful for, for physics. And that's true of most basic uh, machine learning uh, models. So from the start, the vision was to try to get outreach across fields, across applications, across different communities. And truly for me, the importance here is that we want to enable people to do new things. I uh, want you to do things I haven't thought about and to surprise me, uh, because this creates innovation. 
So there's really a question of lowering the bar here. And we chose to use uh, Python. Uh, one of the reasons is that it is a high-level language, uh, and that's important both for users and developers. But another reason is that it's not a general purpose. R, for instance, is very focused towards statistics. Uh, MATLAB is very focused towards numeric. Python is general. You can do text processing in it, but numeric in it also. And back when we made the deci decision, it seemed important. And I guess history has told us that we're probably right, because what you see here is the growth of Google searches uh, with machine learning in Python versus machine learning in R. So machine learning in Python is light blue, machine learning in, in R is the dark blue. So what you're seeing is that we've overtook them. Yes. Java just completely failing. And actually, Scikit-Learn is following that growth quite well. So uh, I think that was a good choice. It's really hard for us to estimate our user base. We are a fully open source uh, project. We impose absolutely no restriction on how you use us. Uh, but what we see is that on the website, we have approximately between three and 400 returning, returning users uh, per week. So these are people who look at the documentation often. So we think these are users. So we're in a few hundred thousand users, and the paper is almost 8,000 8, citations. So please do cite it. Uh, and then if we look at who uses us, that's based on a survey. We have two thirds of people who use us who come from the industry and one, and one third from academia. What's the time frame? 15 minutes, very good, yeah. Uh, so from the start, we wanted to, to work on outreach. We wanted to target as many people, make it as easy as possible to, to use. And this has forced us to explore trade-offs that are not the typical trade-off of your machine learning uh, research paper. So typically, we worry a lot about uh, algorithms and models that have a good failure mode. Uh, we worry a lot about the corresponding uh, uh, default parameters for people not to have to be expert in setting the parameters for the, the algorithm to, to, uh, to converge. Uh, and this is actually very hard for statistical computing because we're giving a tool and it should work on everything. So people shove in data that is ridiculous in the tool. I'm not blaming them. My data is ridiculous too. But then, you know, that discovers bug and stabilities, things like this. And over the time, when we get feedback, we work on improving the models. So something as simple as a Lars, so Lars least angle regression is an algorithm to solve the Lasso problem. It's actually a terribly unstable algorithm if you don't code it right. It's very, very, very tricky to code Lars right. Uh, we still have bugs in our Lars, and we've like worked on it hugely. And the other thing that we focused on was a very didactic documentation. And I like to think of it as a course on 101 machine learning. Our point of view is not, hey, if you want to use scikit-learn, you got to know, you got to have taken classes in machine learning. Our point of view is let's, let's try to make, put it in people's hand so that they can solve problems. <clears throat> so because of this, uh, we also decided to make it a library and not a program. Because the library is something that you can integrate in a bigger pipeline. If I have a physics experiment that does data acquisition, data munging, and feeds back on the experiment, I can't you know, go through clicking on a graphical user interface. So it's about you know, outreach, but not dumbing down. We're, we're not trying to um, um, baby food people. So the model of the API, I like to think of it as that of a gray box. The idea is that we're providing building bricks that you can assemble. Uh, it's important for us to, buy, to provide those elementary building blocks because people will instantiate them differently in, uh, on the different applications. Uh, and the idea is that they should be mostly interchangeable. And the API, if you don't know it, is the following. You instantiate something that we call a, an estimator or a classifier, and you give it all the parameters. So then it's instantiating, it's in, independent of the data, but it's ready to go. <clears throat> and then you fit it on data. If it's a supervised problem, you have data and label. And once it's fitted, it's ready to be used for prediction uh, or to transform data. But the, so that's a black box. I can 
express all my models like this, and if I can't express them like this, they can't come in scikit-learn. That's the rule. Uh, uh, but behind this black box, we give access to the internal parameters of the model. So for instance, if it's a linear model, then we have the coefficients of the linear map, okay? So that's what I call the, 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 gray, the gray box uh, model. And this, by the way, I, I think has been fairly crucial for the success of uh, scikit-learn because people can go from not understanding the model and using it to understanding the model and probing it. So we have a huge uh, feature set. We have uh, 160 estimators that cover all kinds of different things. We don't really cover deep learning. I mean, you, we have multi-layer perception, so if you really want, you could do it. But the idea is that we don't depend on GPUs. We don't use GPUs, so you really shouldn't use us to do deep learning. If you're using us to do deep learning, you're doing it wrong. Uh, so we've looked at what models people use, and it's really interesting. Uh, and that, that, by the way, matches a survey that on, like, independent of the tool, is the number one model that people use is, uh, is a linear model. That's the number one thing that's used in many, across many, many applications, followed by random forest, followed by PCA, k-means, naive phase, and nearest limit. So we have much more fancy algorithms but it's always the simpler algorithms that you get used most. And I think that's a fairly important uh, message. Just to show you that we have fancy stuff, and if you know scikit-learn, just so that maybe you learn something. Uh, recently, we got the Saga solver for logistic regression. So the Saga solver is a stochastic solver, the second order stochastic solver. Uh, that does multiple pass on your data to estimate, uh, to approximate the, um, the curvature uh, and of the loss function. And hence, tends to converge really well on mid-sized data. What I call mid-sized data is data that fits in your memory, but that is really big and completely flies off any kind of, of cache. So that's pretty good. And another thing that we did a, a little while ago is to put in our PCA uh, a, a heuristic, a well-calibrated heuristic, to automatically switch from um, a PCA to randomized linear algebra. Now, most people, unfortunately, do not know randomized linear algebra. Randomized linear algebra on large data set gives you orders of magnitude speed up uh, for no loss in quality. So that helps uh, fighting global warming. That's a great thing. Uh, and the good thing is now, by default, scikit-learn will use it. And you can always over overwrite this if you don't trust it. Uh, so the reason we're able to do this, by the way, is, as I said, we have a huge team that's been growing over the years. We have a, a monthly number of different contributors that this is on the order of 25 people. More than 700 people have contributed to scikit-learn, and we have 20 people who we consider as core developers. So from the start, there was a focus on, on this project being a community-driven project. So recently, because we're having a, a hard time scaling, uh, including all the algorithms that might be useful, we've created Scikit-Learn Country, which is a place where we will host projects that are not inside Scikit-Learn, but that try to obey the rules of API and quality of Scikit-Learn. And we try to help a bit people to do this, but not too much because we're completely drowning on their work. So it's it's... Growing fast, it's exciting for me. All right, now in the last few minutes, I'd like to talk about Nylon because this is medical imaging, and I'd like to see what we can, what we can learn from Nylon. So our goal, my personal goal with Nylon is, is to make fancy data processing easier, to commoditize uh, fancy publications. So for instance, there is this publication by this Japanese group uh, a while ago, almost 10 years ago, that showed that they can do reconstruction of the visual field from uh, the human brain activity. So that's a decoding problem. And our goal is to make it so easy that it becomes boring. And so you now have an example, because these people shared the data. You now have an example that you can run that basically reproduces the gist of their, of their paper. It's not the exact same method, because there are ways of doing it simpler, but it's there. You can run it. It's easy. <clears throat> so the challenges that we have to solve for this goal is the, the first one is to get data for people to be able to try things out. And that's, that's a big problem for us because it's not a problem that we can solve. We need to basically beg people to share interesting data. And there are things in scikit-learn that we can't develop 
because we can't show that they work on open data. That's a bit of a curse of the medical imaging field is that medical imaging field is often not interested in sharing data. Uh, then the second thing is that we need to message the data to go from images to something that we can uh, uh, stick in a scikit-learn uh, estimator and that is quite often very simple signal processing but it turns out it's very important. And then an important challenge is documentation. I spent one third of this talk explaining you what are the problems of machine learning in, in medical imaging because it's important to understand them well. And finally, uh, we find that we absolutely need to have good output and good visualization because this is how people are able to understand what they're doing and whether the thing works or not. Okay, so I could run an example, but I don't have time. So basically, I'm going to walk you through this. The idea is that our examples fetch the data from internet then uh, quite often what they'll do is that they'll, they'll use what we call a masker object that goes from 3D or 4D images to uh, 2D feature matrix uh, uh, by, by transforming the data and there are a bunch of different options that you can, you can pass to the masker. Uh, and then once the data is transformed, we just use scikit-learn. That's easy. And once we're done, we just plot things or save them. Now there's a bit more to it, and I won't cover this, but we've also um, uh, included specific learners that are that, that are very useful if you for the, the kind of data that you have in brain imaging. So typically, highly correlated, low SNR uh, spatial maps. So, for instance, that that's a total variation uh, penalty here. It it learns to predict while while segmenting segmenting maps. Uh, and this is, for instance, so these are very simple examples. You can run them. And this is something that will extract brain regions using dictionary learning from REST data. And these, by the way, are the examples of the output of the examples. So this runs. And here you have a connectome that's run and extracted. <clears throat> okay. So to conclude, maybe, maybe I should say all these examples, by the way, they run on the cloud every time we do a commit. So we're testing that our stuff works on real imaging data, always, always, always. So, so to conclude, my, the, my goal, or one of my goals with one of my hats, is to democratize machine learning for medical imaging, but uh, for also other applications, I think it's important. Uh, the first thing that we need to do is the generic set of robust algorithm. And um, I have the impression I'm always talking about boring science because I tend not to talk about very fancy things because what we find is that people don't need very fancy things. They need very classic things that are extremely robust. Uh, then for a given application, you need to worry about I.O. input output, so visualization and open data. And from this, I think it's really useful to build a complete set of runnable examples. And look at those examples and worry if they solve day-to-day -day problems that people have or not. And just work on your library, work on your example until people look at the example and go like, wow, this is what I want. And then you've won. You've created an interest. And on top of this, you need to worry about the documentation, the API, the ease of installation to lower the bar. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you.